So this is the second half of a lecture on pathogenesis and virulence from March 30th, 2020. And the focus of this lecture is really to talk about um, specific factors known as virulence factors that make microorganisms more harmful to their hosts and talk about mechanisms by which they do that. <coughs> and so when talking about how pathogens cause disease, there are two terms that sort of come up. The first is pathogenicity which is just the potential of any microorganism, virus, or bacteria to cause harm to its host or to cause disease. And virulence is a little bit different than pathogenicity. So what virulence is, is how harmful that particular microorganism is to the host or how much damage that pathogen can cause. And so pathogenicity is really just the potential to cause disease, whereas virulence is how bad that disease is going to be. And the virulence of pathogens is typically correlated to how well they survive outside their host. And so you can imagine <coughs> that if a particular pathogen is extremely virulent or extremely harmful to its host, it runs the risk of killing that host before it can be passed on or transmitted to a new host. And so would you expect a pathogen with high virulence to survive well outside of its host or to survive less well. You would expect a pathogen that has very high virulence or sort of is very harmful to be able to just survive well outside the host in the external environment because it will probably need to survive in that external environment as it after it kills that host and before it can find a new one. And so there is some correlation um, between modes of transmission and how well pathogens survive in the external environment as well as during those transmission um, times <coughs> and how virulent those particular pathogens are. And the thing that really confers this virulence or this harmfulness of pathogens are specific factors known as virulence factors. And virulence factors are intrinsic to the pathogen itself. So they make the pathogens more harmful um, by being expressed or made by specific pathogens. And so <coughs> virulence factors can be structural things um, such as pili um, or fimbria on the outside of bacteria. They can also be soluble um, protein products like enzymes or different chemicals or toxins, but their main purpose is to increase the pathogenicity and virulence of a particular pathogen. So they are there to make that pathogen more harmful to its host. And in terms of bacteria, there's actually this really interesting way that bacteria encode their virulence factors <coughs> in their DNA. And so they may encode virulence factors in the chromosomes or in different plasmids, but all of these virulence factors are found in what are known as pathogenicity islands within those segments of DNA. A pathogenicity island is basically just a sequence of DNA or a segment that has this characteristic structure and sequence, um, and all of the virulence factors for a particular organism can be found in one specific segment of that DNA, either in the chromosome or in a plasmid. <laughs> and some of these pathogenicity islands, as well as the gene products that they make, can be seen in this table 35.2 down here. And you'll notice that some of the functions um, are here <coughs> on the far right. And they actually um, have a, several different functions, all of which would increase that virus, or I'm sorry, that organism's ability to be harmful to the host. So right, some of the gene products are toxins, as you can see here. Some of them are involved in allowing um, intracellular survival or promoting the survival of those particular organisms so that they can continue to infect the host. Um, what's important to remember is all these virulence factors, whether they're structural, whether they're a toxin, whether they're a product, are designed to make um, pathogens more harmful to their host. <coughs> and they can do that in a couple different ways, right? And so the first is sort of obvious, right? Um, and so in order to cause an infection and cause a disease, the pathogen has to be able to effectively 
um, survive and colonize host cells. And so one thing that virulence factors can do is help pathogens adhere to the host cells and multiply <coughs> from the very beginning to cause an infection. And um, some of the virulence factors involved in this mechanism um, encode structures. So structures such as pili or fimbria, which you can see here. We talked about how pili and fimbria are used for attachment to surfaces. Cell membranes count as surfaces as well. And so um, some pathogens use their pili to adhere to bacteria, to uh, their host cells and ultimately <coughs> colonize particular tissues. Um, structures on the outside of bacteria like membrane and capsule proteins are also virulence factors. They can help bacteria adhere to host cells as well and start colonizing that particular tissue. And we've already talked about viral um, spike proteins in the envelopes of particular viruses in our virus lecture and those spike proteins are also virulence factors as they can help the virus um, attached to a host cell membrane and ultimately enter that cell and start replicating. Another thing that virulence factors can do is not just promote that first infection by adhering and colonizing a tissue, but they can also help the <coughs> infection, infection and pathogens spread or invade other tissues. And so some uh, virulence factors um, will promote invasion by producing structures or substances that can allow the pathogen to spread more easily. And so some examples of that, <coughs> if a pathogen is infecting your, the surface of your skin and wants to spread into your actual bloodstream or body, the skin epithelia sits on what's called a basement membrane. Um, some pathogens will create structures or substances that can chew through that basement membrane and allow a pathogen to move from the surface of your skin in deeper into your body. <coughs> One other um, pretty common virulence factors that pathogens will produce is what's known as an exotoxin. And so exotoxins are soluble proteins. They're secreted out into the environment from bacteria. And then they act at target cells that are sort of distant from the bacteria itself, and they can exert a lot of different effects because they're highly variable in their structure. But one thing that's similar about exotoxins, <coughs> all exotoxins, is that they are extremely toxic and sometimes lethal. Um, and so even in very, very small doses, exotoxins can exert a pretty serious effect. One of the most commonly, um, I guess, talked about exotoxins is botulinum toxin. It's produced by the pathogen Clostridium botulinum, and it can cause botulism um, in high doses. It's also used in a diluted form as Botox. Um, its mechanism of action is to stop neurotransmitters from being released, so to stop your neurons from firing, <coughs> which can lead to paralysis. And so in small amounts like Botox, it leads to paralysis of the face muscles, and you can keep a nice wrinkle-free face. Um, but in higher doses, that botulinum toxin can ultimately lead to paralysis of your entire body. And so exotoxins are very dangerous because they are so effective in such small doses, and also because they're relatively resistant to heat. And so a lot of the soluble proteins are actually pretty resistant to high temperatures, which means it can be hard to get rid of these toxins. Additionally, because they travel away from the site of infection, it means that that toxin can be moving throughout your entire body, even though the bacteria might be kind of stuck in one particular tissue. <coughs> Exotoxins are usually produced by gram-positive bacteria, um, whereas endotoxins, which are um, another type of toxic compound that's also used as a virulence factor, are produced by gram-negatives. And they're only exist, they only exist in gram-negatives because really there's only one type of endotoxin, it's called lipid A, and it's part of the lipopolysaccharide, or LPS, that's bound to this outer membrane of gram-negative bacteria. And <coughs> one thing that is fortunate about endotoxins, at least from the host perspective, is that they're only released when that bacteria dies. And so exotoxins can be secreted from gram-positive bacteria 
throughout its life cycle um, because they are made and then released from a living cell. Whereas endotoxins of gram-negative bacteria are lipopolysaccharides, right? So they're bound to this outer membrane permanently unless that bacteria dies and can release that endotoxin. And so endotoxins are not quite as commonly used as exotoxins, um, but they do lead to some pretty um, pretty intense and um, toxic effects as well. And so one other thing in addition to kind of helping pathogens um, adhere, <coughs> colonize, invade, and then start to kill host cells with toxins um, that virulence factors can do is improve development of what's called a biofilm. And so we're going to talk more about biofilms later in the semester, but for now what you need to know is that a biofilm is basically a community of microbes or bacteria that's held together by sticky secreted substances, um, usually carbohydrates or polysaccharides. And so what a biofilm does is it basically holds all of these microbes together. They can be the same type of microbe, they can be different types of microbes, but they're all held together in sort of a <coughs> sticky community, which you can see here inside of a pipe on the right. And what you can imagine is that these biofilms are actually really difficult to destroy. They're difficult to destroy in this pipe. They're difficult to destroy in your body. And so one, a biofilm sort of improves the physical resistance that pathogens have and makes them more virulent because of it. So biofilm will stick around inside your body because it's hard to destroy it, which gives pathogens more of a chance to do more harm. And what's also really interesting that biofilms can do is they can sort of pass antibiotic resistance and also immune response resistance plasmids between them and create sort of this like antibiotic immune resistant um, whole community. And so instead of one type of microbe having that resistance, they can sort of pass it between all the microbes within the biofilm <coughs> and create a very resistant, difficult to destroy structure of microbes. And you can imagine that that would increase the virulence because if it's hard to destroy, it can continue infecting your body for a long time. And there's not a lot that you can do about it. And so one last thing that a virulence factor can do is partly related to the biofilms, right? It's improved resistance to host defenses. And so maybe your um, pathogen can't make a biofilm, um, but like a virus can't really be part of a biofilm, um, but it can be, um, it can still find ways to improve its resistance to the host immune system, as well as physical defenses that the host can kind of put up and use to fight pathogens. <clears throat> and so some virulence factors will make their pathogens more physically resistant to um, degradation, to immune cells binding and recognizing them. Uh, it'll help them avoid detection by the immune system. Um, some virulence factors will help their pathogens survive better inside of a host cell so they can effectively hide inside a host. Um, and then, sort of interestingly, some virulence factors will make what are called decoy proteins. And so normally, uh, an antimicrobial compound would find specific pathogens by the proteins that are expressed on the outside of it. And so what some pathogens can do with using their virulence factors is make these decoy proteins that bind up all of those <coughs> antimicrobial compounds and keep them busy while they still continue infecting the host. And so there are a lot of different ways um, that pathogens can sort of avoid host defenses and virulence factors are the way that, and some unvirulence factors can actually encode all of these different things.